Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, that was very, very good. Good prayer. That was very good. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us again to break bread, the bread of life. Lord God Almighty, we are asking that your word will give nourishment to our soul. We are asking that your word will renew our mind. Lord, we pray your word will cause us to grow in the knowledge of you. Lord, we pray your word will equip us to live the way you want us to live. Your word will inform our way of thinking, the choices we make, the people we interact with, the places we go to. We pray that your word will do wonders in the lives of both the speaker and the hearers in Jesus' name. The Bible says, Whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. That man shall be blessed in his deed. Lord, help us as we look at the mirror of your word. Help us not just to come here like we have prayed, to check a box, but give us receptive hearts that the word will bear fruits in our lives in Jesus' name. For your servant, you have used to lead us today this powerful session of prayer. Lord, I pray you will continue to pour into him more grace, more anointing, more unction, the Bible says, I write unto you, young men, for ye are strong. For the word of God abideth in you. Lord, I pray day to day, let that be his experience. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome again to uh, the study of God's word. I'm going to read the scriptures in Genesis Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. But no, let, let, let me do this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 so that we can, by God's grace, continue to maintain that connection. Uh, the way I tend to think about it is this, you know, and perhaps you've heard me say this many times. When I open my Bible, uh, and, and, the, and I think how I got stuck with this idea was, I, I don't know, I, I got a copy of the Bible. I'm not sure if it's Matthew Henry or Dix or one of them, or Scofield, one of the Bible. They showed Genesis to Revelation and they now drew like a graph and they called it the stream of inspiration how it was flowing from Genesis to Revelation, that image stuck with me. So anytime I approach God's word, I am always trying to make sure I go with the flow of the stream of inspiration. So I said all that to say, let's back up to Genesis chapter 2. And I'm going to read um, from verse 21 because of time. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because 
she was taken out of man. Here, the female human being was called woman. And if you recall, if you recall last week, this designation or title referred to her relationship to the man, right? In verse 18, she was created as a help meet for him. So Adam, by the inspiration of God, um, or, or Moses when he was writing, by the inspiration of God in communicating this account, used that label that Adam knew that the woman, the female human being that I have, we are partners. She's someone that will work alongside me. She's somebody that will be a suitable help for me. And use the word woman. So hold that thought. Hold that thought. Because last week we made a connection. Now, chapter 3. Chapter 3. In verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name. Eve, because the Bible gives us the meaning why he used this designation, this label, because she was the mother of all living. So this time the label is not woman or the name. The name now is now Eve, right? Connoting this notion of being a life giver. So he's calling attention to her function as the mother of all living. Her function. So we, 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 we saw that last week. I just wanted to make sure we are grounded in God's word. So again, as we look at this series, don't forget, it's one question we are trying to answer. What does it mean to be a woman? And we've been looking at this for quite some time now. We've looked at the calling of the woman. We started to explore the capacities of a woman. We've looked at the capacity for partnering. We started to look at the capacity for nurturing. And if Jesus tarries, to close out this series, we are going to look at the comportment of a woman. It's like tying it all together as we think about biblical femininity. So last week, we sort of went somewhat in depth as we looked at the concept of nurturing. And don't forget, biblical femininity not only has the capacity to partner, but also the ability to nurture others, right? And, and when we were looking at God's word and we read the verses we studied, we came to a conclusion that nurturing is synonymous to loving, to caring, to giving, to disciplining, to mentoring, to cherishing, to growing, to pouring into others. You can go on and on and on. And remember, it occurs in various ways, in various contexts, in various relationships. So think about all the relationships that you have let's say as a young girl in high school, there's relationship right there in school with your classmates, with your teachers, with your school administrator, right? As a young woman in college, there are, you are in a different context. There is relationships. Obviously we started looking at the family, right? The family, Adam and Eve. 
Yeah, so there's there's relationship as we think about the family. Then there is relationship as we think about members of this group, for example. Right? There, there is relationship there. And you can tell as we've been studying that we've been nurturing one another by the comments brethren have shared, people have shared. Uh, on this topic, we've been nurturing one another. We've been pouring into one another, right? So, you know, as you think about all that, you you, you think about, uh, again, nurturing in different spaces, in different contexts. And one of the key things we pursued last week was nurturing is life-giving. And we, I just read that. Eve was the mother of all living. She was a life giver. God desires for all women, all girls, and by extension, everyone, every one of us, to be life givers. But the focus is on biblical femininity. The godly girl, the godly woman will always create an environment where life thrives. The young girl, the single young woman, the married young woman, the aged woman. If you find through, through biblical femininity, they will always create an environment where life will thrive. They are life givers. So, so as you think about biblical femininity, it's a, 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 a godly person embraces and cherishes the privilege of being able to nurture another person. For a mother, it's an awesome privilege to nurture that child in the womb and later in the in, in life. All right. So so we, we we talked about that that last week. And as you think about nurturing, we said biblical femininity entails nurturing a person for life and for the glory of God. You know, you know I liked what people shared last week, and I wanted to highlight it again for us to nurture one another. So I asked the question, what are different ways in which women express their nurturing capacity to give and foster life. And Sia said, being patient and never giving up when things get difficult. Joshua said, by being sensitive to things that are not easy to see and caring enough to unleash healing. Oiza said, encouraging people's dreams. Angel said, understanding others. Joshua said, showing sympathy towards others. Oiza also added, speaking positively into people's present and future. Again, if you and I can pray and do everything that they've said, we will have lived a life that honors God and gives him glory. If we can do it, then uh, uh, Sister Taiwo said, using your time to help others with love, without expecting anything in return. I, I left her quote for last, and I'll tell you why. Because today we want to follow along with the comment she made. Because the last phrase of her comment is very, uh, is very insightful that you and I must not miss. She said, you help others with love, 
without expecting anything in return. That's what we call sacrifice. So today, I want to nudge us to sort of look at nurturing from this aspect of self-sacrifice. That nurturing is not only life-giving, but nurturing is self-sacrificing. So that's the that's the, that's what we want to pursue today. We want to pursue this idea of nurturing as self-sacrificing. So what do we mean by that? It means you give yourself sacrificially for the benefit of another. Obviously, is this notion of being unselfish. You are self-sacrificing. So think about that. The related idea is that you are depleting your own resources, your own energy, your life on behalf of someone else. So I want you to think about that very broadly. When you talk about your resources, time is a resource. Your money is a resource. Your intellectual capacity and ability is a resource. You know, your creativity, your artistic creativity is a resource. When you deplete, so to speak, when you give you use your energy, your talents, your ability, and you do it on behalf of someone else. You are engaging in nurturing. And that's biblical femininity. So it's easy to think about this if we go from the natural, then we go to the spiritual. Jesus always did that. So think about a mother in engaging and nurturing capacity, a mother sacrificially gives her own body, her resources to nourish and strengthen another. In the process, depletes her own body. Every one of us here, we can agree for a fact. My mother carried me in her womb for nine months and she was nourishing me. She was strengthening me. And guess what? In doing that, she was depleting her own body. She was depleting resources, giving me all I needed, all you needed. In actual fact, that process of self-sacrifice, sometimes it comes with a lot of pain. Even the process of having the baby. Even sometimes some women die in the process. They give their life for another to survive. I know you know the story of uh, Benjamin, the brother of Joseph. You know that story. Jacob married two women. You know the story, how that situation ended or started. And Rachel was trying to have a baby. She had trouble having a child. Then she had Joseph. Then she had another child. And as she was giving birth, she was dying. And she says, we are going to call the name of that child Benuna, meaning bitterness. What she was experiencing was she was in so much pain and agony until she breathed her last and she died. She gave her life for another to survive. I, I just wanted you to see that. Now, we're going to take a step back and look at this from 
the from, from a spiritual angle. In Isaiah, you know this scripture, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. I want to read God's word. Let me read from verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You know the story very well. This is the story of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that story. What Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Right. You know it. What he did on the cross. How he gave himself on the cross. His body was broken. His blood poured out on the cross. To bring life. To bring healing. To bring hope to dead people. I, I wanted you to see nurturing in the context of self-sacrifice. What Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary we were dead in sins and trespasses. And he went to the cross and took my place and took your place. Gave his life he died so that you and I can live. I, I want to plead with you. Don't take the sacrifice of Jesus for granted. Don't do it. Don't take it for granted. If you are here, you have not made him your Lord and Savior. He died so that you can live. He died to set you free from sin. His body was broken on the cross. His blood, the pierced him and water and blood gushed out so that you can have life. And let me stretch that a little bit. I don't know what pain you are carrying. I don't know what grief you are carrying. I don't know what sorrow, what's making you sad and downcasted and depressed. In verse 4, the Bible says he has borne our griefs. That pain, that grief, that sorrow you are carrying, that thing that is causing you depression, Jesus died on the cross so that you don't have to carry it yourself. Give him up to Jesus. That grief, that sorrow, that anguish, that pain. Maybe these are things you can't share with anyone because you are hot, you are bruised and damaged and you say, I cannot even tell anyone. But I'm telling you, Jesus in expressing nurturing, went to the cross and bled. He bore your griefs. He carried your sorrows. You don't have to carry it anymore. Submit it to Jesus. Come to Jesus. As a believer, I want you to have an appreciation of what Jesus made possible when he died for you and he died for me. It's not only salvation from sin, but he died to save us from suffering, from pain, from grief, from sorrow, from anguish. It's a whole package that becomes available to you and me because his sacrifice is all 
on the cross. Now, we are talking about nurturing. I, I, I wanted us to see the physical, and I wanted us to have an appreciation of the spiritual. But, but let's, let's, let's dive a little bit more. Let's, let's dive a little bit more on that. Think about the death of Christ. How that brought life to mankind. How his life became your life. And I want you to think about your impact in the life of others. Are you the type that except something is convenient for you, you, you don't want to do it? It's not convenient. I have my time all planned out. I have my way of doing my thing. I don't want anyone messing up my schedule. It's me, myself, and I. Then you don't understand biblical femininity. Because God expects you to unleash your nurturing capacity. And nurturing is self-sacrificing. I, I want to read a scripture to you in First Kings. In First Kings chapter 3. This is the account of the wisest man that ever lived that talked about two women. First Kings chapter 3. I want to read uh, a few verses. First Kings chapter 3. I want to read or let somebody who has a very nice, strong voice, let someone help me. And I say fast reader. Sometimes I read slow. From verse 16, First Kings chapter 3, verse 16 to verse 27. Who wants to help me? Read nice, nice, strong voice and pace yourself. First Kings chapter 3, verse 16 through verse 27. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. They came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And then one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in a night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while that handmaid slept and left it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, nay, for the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, no, but the dead is thy son and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Verse 23. Then said the king, the one saith, this is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for a bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine or thine, but divide it. Verse 27. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Yeah, that was that was beautifully done, my sister. That was amazing. I read this story for us to think about this idea of nurturing as self-sacrificing. This is a very good story or account in the Bible to think about. You have these two women. They had a baby. They each had a baby. And one of them 
the child died. The other one, the child was alive. And this argument started. What we read, playing out. There were no witnesses. No witnesses to the birth of the two babies. No witnesses to the death of one. How do you try this case in court? It will be one woman's word against the word of the other woman. But Solomon, by the wisdom of God, wanted to call our attention to who a true mother is. What defines a true mother? So what Solomon did was he bypassed the words of the women and went right to their heart, right? He wanted to, he wanted to unpack what was in the heart. And, and listen now, the heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. So how did Solomon try to figure out who is telling a lie and who is telling the truth? Solomon decided he was going to examine this case by investigating or by appealing to a woman's maternal instinct. That's what Solomon was doing. He wanted to call attention and say, Every true woman will express love and self-sacrifice. The Bible uses the expression, which, which I thought is very fascinating, in verse 26. Then speak the woman whose the living child was unto the king. Listen now, listen now. For her bowels yearned. That's the key to help you unpack that verse. For her bowels yearned upon her son. You see that? The heart of the true mother was, was stirred up. Solomon revealed the heart of that woman. And Solomon said, this is the mother. Her kindness emerged. The other woman's cruelty to show that you are not a true mother. Her cruelty was exposed. Why do we know this woman was the true mother? It's not just based on just the maternal instinct. Look at what she did. She was willing to let the child go rather than see that child getting harmed. Her love came out. So again, maybe those who are girls here, who are singles here, we say, what are we talking about? Maybe I'm talking to people who are married. No, I, I don't want you to, I don't want you to, I'm, I'm calling attention to core principles in God's word. Are you willing to let go of privileges? of rights, are you willing to let go so that harm will not come to someone? If you are like that, you are not sure. Now, I know there's a lot of conversations around being a career woman. And it's something I've been reflecting a lot about. And, you know, by God's grace, my wife is a career woman. When I mean career woman, she works. She works a professional job. My wife works a professional job. See, it's important to know that mothering and childbearing do not in any way suggest that a woman is wasting her education, her intelligence, her talents. Listen, don't Believe that lie. 
I'm not suggesting you should decide to be a full-time housewife. But what I'm addressing is this. If you choose you and your husband, you choose to do that. Don't let anybody send you down. Uh, how do they say it in English? Uh, send you on a guilt trip. In actual fact, motherhood at its best is the ultimate expression of sacrificial love. But let me let me also help you think about this a little bit differently. Do you think? Again, there's nothing wrong with being a professional. I want you to, I want you to listen well. Do you think a woman, very brilliant, very intelligent, very talented, that chooses to invest 100%, quote and unquote, you know what I mean, of her time training her children, building a home. And the husband, by God's grace, is in a position to function 100% as the provider. You think that woman is stupid? Or you think the person who goes to work with Coca-Cola, again, I don't know of anybody, I'm just making this up now, is more impactful than that woman. Then you don't understand the capacity of a life. A woman that says, I'm going to use all my intelligence and gifting and ability and all my degrees and certificates, I am going to pour into my children. I went to school when I was doing my second bachelor's degree with an unbeliever, not a Christian. Unbeliever. She was coming back to school after 10 years. Again, I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just, I'm just sharing for you to have a biblical perspective. This was, she was a top level engineer. She gave up that job for 10 years to go and raise her kids. That's what she said, unbeliever. I wanted to raise my kids. You talk to some young women today, they will say you are crazy. You are you are old school. You, how can you step away from your engineering job and you are going and say, I want to go and raise my kids? Unbeliever. Then you see people who are believers, even sometimes persecuting other Christians who choose to do that. Say, ah, look at them. I don't know what this Christianity has made them. This sister that has a master's degree She's decided to be a homemaker. I, I just wanted you to have an appreciation of choosing to be a mother and to be a homemaker is not a waste. In actual fact, let me phrase it this way. It's actually at its best a way of expressing your education your intelligence, and your talents. So when these people out there, they come to you with that perspective, I want you to be grounded in God's word. Again, I'm not saying you cannot be an engineer. Many of our women are outstanding engineers. I'm not saying you cannot be a physician. Many of our sisters are outstanding physicians. I'm not saying you cannot be um, a professor. No, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying don't buy the perspective that the person that chooses in collaboration with their husband to stay at home full time, don't think they are wasting their ability. That's the, that's the thing I, I, I want you not to miss. I, I pray we'll understand that in Jesus' name. Now, it's also important to know that the expression of nurturing capacity is not limited to childbearing, right? I know you say I'm not married, I'm single, or I'm, I'm, I'm 15. You are in the right 
fellowship today. Because I'm talking to you. You're in the right fellowship. Another idea I want to communicate before I leave is there are boys that are here today and there are men that are here today. I want to say mothering is not exclusive to women. This is very important. This, and I'm going to ground it on scripture. So that if you have any wrong uh, perspective on mothering, I, I want you to be helped from God's word. Because men can fulfill this role, the role of mothering in different ways. Numbers chapter 11. Sister Taiwo, you are my reader today. That was awesome. Numbers chapter 11, verse 10 through verse 13. Numbers chapter 11, verse 10 through verse 13. Let's read that. Praise the Lord. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? That you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them to your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight, and don't let me see my wretchedness. Thank you so much. That's, that's wonderful. See, we can sit on these verses and go for an entire study. But let me just call your attention to a few things. So we read this scripture because of this notion, this idea that mothering is not exclusive to women. So we read the account of Moses. The children of Israel were complaining they were only eating manna. Moses was very angry. And Moses began to speak to God. Listen to what Moses said. Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say to me, carry them, right? So Moses is to carry them, right? That thou shouldest say to me, carry them in thy bosom. That's nurturing. A man being given a mandate to carry the children of Israel is carrying them to the land of promise. He now says, as a nursing father beareth the suckling child. The, the, the images we put on slides, they're intentional. Right? They are intentional to help you to illustrate the concept. That's why as a man and the boys who are here, don't leave stuff to just your sisters. Get up. Go in the kitchen. Vacuum the floor. Clean the house. Help the younger ones. Don't sit down there on some device. Parents, don't even let your children do that. Don't, don't even let them think of it. If you have male children and you have female children and the only the girls are running around, take that device from them. Take it from them. If they ask you, sorry, I'm laughing. If they ask you, who told you to take it? Tell them, Brother Henry. <laughs> that Brother Henry was preaching. Go and get mad at Brother Henry. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. But the point is this. He says, as a nursing father beareth the suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. He says, when shall I have flesh to give unto all these people? So nurturing is connected with feeding. 
with feeding. It says, for they weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat. So I, I just wanted you to see that Moses interprets his responsibilities to the people as similar to the care of a mother, right? To feed them, to carry them to the promised land. So I see all that to kind of make this point. Both young and old, men and women alike, can carry out nurturing or can, can be nurturing. You can offer comfort. You can offer encouragement. You can offer nourishment. You can offer sustenance to those who are in need, to those who are vulnerable. You can unleash your nurturing capacity by allowing others to feed from you. So when you allow others to feed for, from you, there is a goal. So you are not enabling uh, bad behavior. So when you say nurturing, don't enable a bad behavior. You allow others to feed from you because you are intentional in transmitting life, faith, strength, grace, anointing. You know that Timothy's mom and grandmom did that. They transmitted faith and anointing and strength to Timothy. That's the word of the Lord. You give your time, your resources, your energy to equip and train others. You can go read Titus chapter 2. Our time is gone. And Proverbs chapter 31. So, but this is what it presupposes though. So don't miss this and we're going to end. It presupposes you know what will bring strength to another person. You know what will empower another person. You know what will equip a person to be who God has created them to be. That's why you give your time. You give your resources. You give your energy because you know, if I give this, it's going to give this person life. It's going to empower them. It's going to equip them. So I see all that to say this. Nurturing is a powerful agent of change. As a young girl, as a young adult, single, you can pour into others. You can train others. You can equip others. You can foster growth in others. You can provide something. You can launch other people into God's purposes for their lives. That is biblical femininity. Nurturing is self sacrificing. Let's go to the Lord in prayers. I want you to pray. I pray you've been blessed today. I want you to pray that God help me. Help me. I will not just hear, but this word will prosper in my heart that right from today, I will begin to practice um, being nurturing other people. Right from today, I will begin to unleash my nurturing capacity, sharing the grace you've given me, the gifts you've given me, the energy you've given me, the ability you've given me, pouring into others, transmitting life, transmitting grace, transmitting faith in the name of Jesus, helping, carrying, feeding, leading, guiding, growing, inspiring, instigating. God, use me to be able to not only give life, but to help train other people to become life givers. Let's pray. Let's talk to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing your word to us today. Lord, we pray we will not just hear, 
but will be doers of the word. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over to you, Hope. Is Hope here? Hey, everyone. Good evening.